Okay, therefore, the most important function of the uh, Council of Ministers is to adopt binding legislation. It is the, one of the decision-making organs of the European Union. But other than that, it adopts the budget of the EU with the Parliament. It coordinates the economic policies of the member states. Um, it concludes international agreements with third countries and international organizations. To conclude an agreement in Turkish. Yes. So in the EU, who negotiates the agreement? Commission. Who concludes? The Council. It is the Commission that negotiates. It is the Council that concludes. It gives the final decision on accession of new member states. It gives the final decision on the accession of new member states. Um, as you know, and as we will be mentioning in a minute, unanimity is very rarely applied in the Council today. Unanimity? Oi Birli is very rarely applied in the Council today. One of these areas that the Council votes by unanimity, unanimity in Turkish, Oi Birli, is the accession of third countries. Therefore, there it decides by unanimity. And the Council also appoints members of some EU institutions, such as the Court of Auditors, the Court of Justice, and the European Commission. One of the important topics as regards the Council of Ministers is the voting. Until the Treaty of Lisbon, the rule in the Council of Ministers was simple majority. Simple majority. The Lisbon Treaty amended this provision. Today, the Council decides by qualified majority voting, unless otherwise is clearly provided in the treaties. The council decides by qualified majority unless otherwise is provided under the treaties. What would that mean? <laughs> Kurcanatlaşmada aksi belirtilmedikçe konsey nitelikli çoğunlukla karar verir. This means that today the rule is qualified majority but the council may also decide by simple majority or by unanimity if it is clearly provided in the treaties. You have the founding treaties of the European Union on Moodle. You can uh, just take a look in the, on the treaties. Depending on the policy areas, sometimes simple majority, although very rarely. Today, in terms of uh, some aspects of free movement of persons, for example, it is provided. Unanimity is provided also rarely. For example, accession of new member states or as regards certain aspects of taxation, again, unanimity is required. But other than these limited areas, the council decides by qualified majority. How is it calculated, qualified majority? What is the name of the system today? Exactly, how do we call this system? Yes, Elif? Exactly. Today, it is called the system of double majority. How was it called before? This, this is the system brought by the Treaty of Lisbon. Uh, how was it called before the Lisbon Treaty? Yes? 
Exactly. The system was totally different. Before the Treaty of Lisbon, it was the system of weighted votes uh, where not the member states had, or each member state had a number of votes depending on its size and population. Uh, the Treaty of Lisbon abolished this system and replaced it with a system of double majority. Today, uh, the council decides by qualified majority, or when the council decides by qualified majority, it is required that 55% of the member states, at least 55% of the member states, which represent the 65% of the total population of the European Union should give positive vote. The blocking minority, the minority, the number of member states to block a legislative instrument is four today according to the founding treaties, at least four member states. Um, this system is found uh, advantages both for the big member states and for the small member states. We have mentioned it before. Could you remind me what is good here for the small member states and what is good for the big member states? It is like a compromise between the big and the small member states. Yes, what's your name again? Gül. Gül. The How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Big member states, the population is important. Mm. From the point of small member states, can we look? Why is it good for small member states? Uh, because um, their <coughs> population is less. And? Uh, they, they can come together with other countries. And no, we, we have to find something good for the small yeah. member states. Yes. Big countries need the small countries in order to, to make the 55% of the members. Exactly. Looking from the small mem smaller member states' point of view, we could say that the big member states always need them to satisfy the requirement in terms of the number of member states. Looking from the bigger member states' point of view, we can say that the smaller member states would always need them as well to satisfy the requirement as regards the population, the total population of the European Union. Today, most of the EU legislation uh, in the Council of Ministers is subject to qualified majority voting. All right. Any questions? Yes? <laughs> Uh, I think that the system of the rated votes didn't uh, seem unfair to me. Why did they change it? What is the reason? Who, who would like to answer this question? Uh, the system was before the system of the rated votes, and I don't think that it's that unfair. And it, I don't see how it makes a difference. Hmm. Because it says... Uh, weighted votes and weights are uh, according to the population and I size. Yeah, the size. So, so what was the problem with the system of weighted votes? Have you read the chapters? You must have an information there. Why the system changed? Mm. I saw her before. Okay. Yes. I I'll try to explain. Uh, for each voting, they distribute the uh, votes in the weighted voting uh, system of weighted votes. So it took a long time to uh, adjust the votes for each voting. And it was like a... a, a how can I explain it? Like, okay. Um, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, for like like I said, like for each voting, they distributed the votes, and it took a long time, so it lengthened the process of voting. I think, as I no sir, how? Okay. Say it again. For every member state, they had to for an, for every new member state, they had to calculate the number of votes again and again. Not for each voting. No, no, no, no. No, no, no, no. There was an established 
number of votes for every member state uh, depending its size and population. For example, 27 members the votes for a member state. Mm -hmm. uh, but for every enlargement or before every enlarge enlargement, they have to calculate the number of votes, the number of weighted votes for every newcomer. This has been very problematic. Mm -hmm. And second, they had to uh, decide also for a majority uh, out of this total number of votes. This has been very problematic as well because this is a very important part of uh, the work of the council and of course every member state want more votes. They would say oh, I am bigger as much as this one or I am more populated than this one. Why would I have only 17 votes for example? So, so the weight wasn't stable. No, no, no. Uh, it was changing from yes, for for every enlargement, uh, if there are, for example, ten member states coming to the European Union before that enlargement, they had to calculate the number of votes again and again. If you read the uh, stages of deepening in the European Union, you would realize that this is one of the major points of discussion uh, between the member states in every intergovernmental conference. Therefore, they wanted to get rid of the system basically and went for a far easier system of double majority. Here there are no weighted votes at all for member states. Each member state has one vote only. Before, for example, under the system of weighted votes, when they were voting in the council, for example, when they were voting, one member state would mean 17, whereas the other one would mean 29 votes. Hmm? So there was a total number of votes and they had to calculate a majority to, de to decide for a, a legislative instrument. They wanted to get rid of this. Yes? Can we also say the weighted vote system was disadvantageous for smaller population countries? Because like whatever England, Germany and France came together and decided something would easily pass on the... Uh, not that much, because you, they also needed uh, for a minimum number of member states to block legislation as well. Therefore, it, it was uh, um, also guaranteed in the European Union. Uh, but still, uh, yes, you are right, Malta, since it is the smallest member state, had always the least votes. It is not possible to give Malta uh, as many votes as Germany. It is never possible if the system is based on size and population. But the population changes from one vote to the next. Like the population of the states change. Mm -hmm. so the size also change. Takes time. Sorry? So the approximation takes time. Even if they uh, yes. have new And there is there was based on bargaining and compromise in the Council of Ministers. Too many political problems as well. But even if like a new, a new state like doesn't become a member from one voting to the next one, the population of a state changes. So shouldn't they distribute? The no, no, no, no, no, no. That would be a disaster. But like yes, it changes, but uh, they would consider it in the uh, next enlargement, before the next enlargement, before the next treaty <laughs> amendment, I would say, before. Uh, otherwise, they had to consider it all, all, all, all um, uh, every time for every member state. Imagine there are now 28, and of course the population is increasing every month, for example. Yes, but like the, vote, yeah, the number of votes might change as well. So. Yes, but they could only uh, discuss this when it comes to a treaty amendment. Before the before a next treaty amendment, they could do it. Otherwise, uh, the agenda of the European Union would be <laughs> only about the calculation of weighted votes. Hmm? That is not possible. Let's move to the European Council. Uh, European Council is composed of... Heads of state or government. Therefore, it is the highest political institution of the European Union. Is it a new institution? Or is it an old one? Is it new? It is old? Compared to much. I 
I mean, it's just an imagination, but I imagine that states came together to form this European Union, so I imagine that the first institution that they built would be European Council. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, as an institution of the EU, it is new because only by the Lisbon Treaty, the European Council uh, is accepted as one of the institutions of the EU. Therefore, it, well, it is accepted in the institution structure of the EU by the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. But the meetings of the European Council, as the summits of the heads of state or government, started in the late 1960s. Therefore, the heads of state or government have been meeting since the 1960s. Although these meetings were ad hoc meetings. Ad hoc? Not permanent, <coughs> ad hoc, not permanent. Uh, the meetings of the European Council were institutionalized in 1974 Paris summit. The meetings involve the heads of state or government, the president of the European Commission, the President of the European Council, and the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. According to the founding treaties, the European Council meets twice every six months, twice every six months, making four meetings in a year. Um, it used to meet in different cities in Europe, and those meetings were known after the name of the city, such as Copenhagen European Council or Madrid European Council, but today it, is usually, it usually meets in Brussels. Therefore, uh, the meetings are usually held in Brussels. It is, as we say, stated, the, politically the highest institution, but has no legislative function at all. It may request the Council or the Commission to adopt legislation in a given topic. It's a political forum for debate, <coughs> negotiation and bargaining in the European Union. And it usually decides by consensus. It is an intergovernmental institution, as you can imagine. And it usually decides by consensus. But if the treaty so provides, it may also decide by simple majority or qualified majority voting. When the treaty so requires, it may also decide by um, qualified majority voting or by simple majority. Okay, I will move to the um, Court of Justice, but before moving that, because we mentioned, we have mentioned the High Representative a couple of times before, uh, let's make it clear who is this High Representative, what is the responsibility. Uh, the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, therefore, is a new post provided by the Treaty of Lisbon. As you know, this post was provided as a foreign minister in the draft constitutional treaty. But following the rejection of the draft in the Netherlands and in France, it is replaced by the high representative. 
This person is responsible from the development of a common foreign and security policy, as well as a defense policy in the EU. What is the role of this person? Uh, yes, what is the role? You will be reading in the books that this person has a dual role. In Turkish, uh, firstly, as we have mentioned, yes, this, this person chairs the Foreign Affairs Council in the Council of Ministers. And secondly, this person is one of the vice presidents of the European Commission. Please read from the textbooks as regards the appointment of uh, the high representative as well. Okay. Now, the Court of Justice of the EU. In Turkish, Avrupa Birliği Adalet Divanı veya ABAT. When we say um, Court of Justice of the European Union, today it is a general name to mean the court structure of the EU. This is a new name. This is provided by the Treaty of Lisbon to uh, mean the judicial structure of the European Union. Today, it includes two courts. It includes two courts, Court of Justice and the General Court. Um, the Court of Justice is, was the first court in the EU. Provided since the EEC Treaty. It includes one judge per member state, making 28 judges. The judges are appointed for a renewable six years. What does renewable six years mean? What does it mean? They can just fire the judge and... After six years, they can be appointed again. Oh, okay. Renewable. Renewable. Uh -huh. And there exist 11 advocate generals. Advocate general Other than judges, there are advocate generals in the court of justice. Um, in Rapporteur. Turkish? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> no. Rapporteur? Yes. Uh, not, we don't translate it as, as such. Uh, no. Kanun koyucu. I sorry. Hukuk sözcüsü veya kanun sözcüsü. Usulden yeni çıktık deyince ben de kanun koyucuya döndüm aynen. Hukuk sözcüsü veya kanun sözcüsü. Uh, these people, the advocate generals, are subject to the same requirements as judges. Uh, they have a very important position in the Court of Justice. They prepare the um, reports for the judges. 
And some advocate generals are very famous in the EU. Their opinions are very important and their opinions are followed by the courts. For example, Advocate General Cocot, known by her name and followed by the Court of Justice. They write opinions on specific cases. Where, uh, when the dispute has ar is arisen, they write their opinions, although those opinions are not binding. But still, very important that it is an, it is an opinion of Advocate General. The judges and Advocate Generals are selected among persons whose independence, independence mm -hmm, is beyond doubt and who satisfy the requirements for appointment to the highest judicial offices in the member states or who are Juris consults who are Juris consults with recognized competence. The judges of the Court of Justice are selected among, from among persons whose independence is beyond doubt and who satisfy the requirements for the highest judicial offices in the member states or who are juris consults with recognized competence. The Court of Justice may sit in three different ways. Sit meaning? Sit and decide. Hmm? Sit and decide. It may decide or it may sit as a chamber in Turkish, daire, including three or five judges. It may decide, it may sit as a grand chamber in Turkish, Büyük Daire, including 13 judges. This is when um, a member state or an EU institution which is a party to the proceedings, a party to the proceedings in Turkish? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, proceedings? Yargılamanın tarafı olan. A party to the proceedings so requests. Therefore, a member state or an EU institution which is a party to the proceedings may may request that the court sits as a grand chamber. And thirdly, it may also decide as a full court, genel kurul, where all the judges sit and decide together for very exceptional issues such as Dismissal of a commissioner. Dismissal of a commissioner or a member of the court of auditors. Okay, the second court today is the general court. In Turkish, 
and general court? Genel Mahkeme in Turkish at the moment. But yes, this used to be the European Court of First Instance, Avrupa İlk Derece Mahkemesi. Its name is changed by the Lisbon Treaty. It was established by the Single European Act as the European Court of First Instance to ease the workload of the Court of Justice to ease the workload of the Court of Justice. It includes at least one judge per member state. It includes at least one judge per member state not necessarily one judge per member state, and today it includes 45 judges in total. What is the country that has the most judges? Um, we have to look because it depends. Uh, it is not the population and size of the member state. Let me check this for next week. Um, the, there are no permanent advocate generals in the general court, but one judge acts, may act as an advocate general when it is so requested or when is, it is necessary. Uh, the members or the judges of the general court are selected from among persons whose independence is beyond doubt and who satisfy the requirements for the high judicial offices in the member states. Okay. Uh, there used to be the European Civil Tri Service Tribunal as well. We have mentioned this before. Uh, that was the only specialized court in the EU. It was founded in 2004 uh, to see the staff cases only staff cases, you will be hearing it again, staff cases in Turkish, personal davaları. This was, this, these are the cases between the EU and its servants, the staff. And this tribunal, the European Civil Service Tribunal, was uh, the one, the court, that dealt with these um, uh, cases, but then it, is, it was decided to transfer the power of the court to the general court and it was dissolved in 2016. Therefore, today, there is no uh, general court. Its power was Sorry, a European Civil Service Tribunal. There is no European Civil Service Tribunal. Its power is transferred to the general court. What is the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union? What does the court do in the EU? Yes? You, you, you. Okay. Uh, we have read that um, the Commission can take member states to the Court of Justice when they infringe EU law, like the Commission versus the United Kingdom. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, but we will be speaking about more general roles or functions for the Court of Justice. So what does it do in that case as well, in the actions for infringement, for example? What is the role? Yes? It interprets the treaties. This is not related with infringement? No. This is something else. Yes, okay. Uh, it is the Court of Justice of the EU that interprets EU law. 
This is a unique role, unique function for the Court of Justice. Uh, as you will be seeing, this is a very important function for a court in the European Union because this is a new legal system. It is far newer than national law. It is far newer than international law as well. So you establish a new legal system with new rules and of course you need a very strong institution to interpret the law. And this is the Court of Justice of the European Union. As we have mentioned, the court has a monopoly to interpret EU norms. The provisions in the treaties, the provisions in the binding instruments, non-binding instruments of EU law. And the unique tool for interpreting EU law, any ideas? What is the tool for the Court of Justice to interpret the EU law as a principle? I am sure you have read. This is a very famous tool in the EU. This is a subject which I like most as well. That is called preliminary rulings procedure. Preliminary rulings procedure under the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. In Turkish, ön karar usulü, ön karar usulü, we will be dealing with this when we speak about the actions under the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice, giving the court a sole right to uh, interpret uh, the EU instruments. All right? Yes. And uh, I mean, are the decisions of Court of Justice of the European Union are bind binding in the member states? The decisions, Always, I mean. yes, the, the rulings of the Court of Justice, the decisions of the Court of Justice. Um, please make sure that you know the difference between decisions of the Court of Justice and decisions as legislative instruments. We use the same term in English uh, and in Turkish, but we mean different things. Decision is, is a legislative instrument, this is something else. Now we speak about the rulings of the court, the decisions of the court, they are binding for all authorities in the member states. The administrative authorities, the, all the organs, uh, including the courts. So they are the highest court as well? Yes, the Court of Justice of the European Union is the highest court in all the member states of the EU as long as the national courts apply EU law. Even if, uh, for example, they are above the, it is above the uh, general uh, federal court of Germany or all the courts. For example, in the UK, in the UK legal system, the highest court in the hierarchy of courts in the UK. What is that? Because you took that course. Supreme court. Yes, it is the Supreme Court of the UK. The e European Court of Justice is, is even higher than that, as long as the courts apply European Union law, okay? Because the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice, of course, is limited with EU law. Whether it interprets the EU law or it deals with the uh, disputes arising from EU law. All right, let's uh, continue next Wednesday.